I will not go through all the introductions. I think everybody knows everyone here. We've been on a, a bunch of these before. So I'll move down to review oh, of minutes. I'm sorry, Mayor Caldwell. Uh, just a sec, we just need to open it up for the public um, as we get started. Just so you know, so the public, if there are any, are all coming in right now and we are good to go. Okay. Up next, we have a, a review and approval of minutes. Um, I would certainly welcome a, a motion to approve those. I read those and found those to be accurate to my knowledge. Mr. Chair, Jeff Silvis County, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. I second. This is Jewel Allen. Thank you. We have a first and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, those will pass unanimously. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Conflict uh, of interest disclosure. Um, I don't know if anybody saw anything here uh, or has anything to add as we go through this meeting. Um, if so, please speak up now. Hearing none, we will say that there are no conflict of interest disclosures that need to be presented. Uh, ULTC <coughs> Board and Commission reports and appointments. Abby. Yes, so we just have one to go over today. Um, it is the Utah, Utah Outdoor Adventure Commission. Uh, so this one's a little unique. Uh, so the league has uh, one appointment and then there's a joint appointment we do with the Utah Association of Counties. Uh, for that, I've received about seven applications. Um, one of those we're looking at is Kate Bradshaw. And Nick should have that document if he wants to share that. Um, and she is a city council member in Bountiful. Uh, she has experience, she's done a budget for Parks and Rec uh, in Bountiful. And she's also worked with uh, Trails Master Plan. And right now we're still coordinating with uh, UAC for that joint appointment. We haven't quite nailed that down yet. Uh, they did recommend a council member from Hingwich, uh, so we're going to explore that a little bit more as well. And kind of what our main goal for this is we want uh, geographical representation across the state. So we want both an urban person as well as um, someone in a more rural area, just so we're not getting everything on that board coming from an urban area. Um, so once we find a second candidate, we're going to run that by UAC and see if they agree with us. Um, the meeting for that commission begins uh, that first week of June, so we'll need to figure that out uh, within the next two weeks. Uh, we don't really need a motion at this time for that, uh, just kind of a general agreement to proceed. And Mayor, Mayor Caldwell, if I can add to what Abby just indicated, um, we are still accepting applications. And so once we get the joint appointment filled with UAC, then we'll fill our individual league appointments. So that's why we're not asking for a motion yet at this point, um, other than just to say that of the candidates we've received so far, um, our, we want to give strong consideration to Kate Bradshaw. Um, but the, the UAC thing just complicates things. Um, and that's what we're hoping to get squared away with UAC in the next few days. But also still accepting applications um, through the end of the week. Okay, sounds good. I appreciate that information item. And just for the record, John Hitsky does love the Beatles. I, I've heard that, but I didn't know it was so blatant as it is now. That's good to know. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions on uh, that presentation and the Outdoor Adventure Commission? Seeing we will then, Mayor, Mayor Caldwell. What we'll do is we'll come back to we'll come back to the officers for final ratification because the Outdoor Adventure Commission wants to meet before the board next meets in mid June. So we'll use the officers to finalize that that's that one and a half positions once we coordinate with you okay sounds great anything else to add okay i appreciate it up next we have strategic goals check-in cameron take it away 
Perfect. Thank you, Mayor. And the the check in is just that we are keeping the strategic goals in the packet over the course of the year. We, as we worked on the tentative budget, worked through the strategic goals to make sure we could still meet the strategic goals. As we've worked through our state and federal advocacy, we keep coming back to the strategic goals. And in light of the urgency of the other issues on the agenda, that's all I'll say unless people have some follow up questions about about the strategic goals, but just make, want to make sure everyone's aware that we are keeping them front and center as we proceed. Thank you. Anybody have any questions or comments? All right, Cam, you got the next one. Fiscal year 2021 tentative budget. Terrific. Thank you. Nick will be sharing the screen here. And just as a reminder to mute yourself if you are, um, if, if you're not presenting and President Mendenhall, welcome. Uh, Mayor Caldwell has been super efficient in your absence as you would expect. <laughs> that mean I'm off the hook? I'm going to mute. <laughs> okay, mute away. Anyway, uh, President Mendenhall, any, anything you want to say before we jump into the tentative budget? No, just uh, thank you, Mayor Caldwell. I think you've done such a great job. You should just keep going. I mean, this meeting is just <laughs> great. Keep going. I don't have, that's thank above my start. Grade. Okay, all right. <laughs> no, thanks, everyone, and uh, let's go. Okay, perfect. Nick, will you go back to the memo? It is in your four packet, but the objective of today's budget conversation is for you to adopt a tentative budget. We will then have a public hearing in June to adopt the final budget. As we have worked through the tentative budget, just like you're doing in your cities, we have been trying to mitigate for all of the known knowns and the unknown unknowns. For example, we have a good chunk of our budget. In fact, Nick, will you, will you zoom down a little bit to keep going? Right there. Oh. Sorry, go back up to uh, keep going. So the the third to last paragraph there, uh, part one revenue. Our revenues come from three sources, membership dues, conference registration, and private sector sponsorships. And those sponsorships are tied to conferences. Right now, we are planning on an in-person conference in September with the understanding that in-person will look different than it did last year. We are also working on what we refer to as Plan B, which is an all virtual conference, and Plan C, which is a hybrid conference. Both of those would have major impacts on both revenues and expenses. For purposes of the tentative budget, we decided to, work to create a budget based on the optimistic Plan A, but we will have better ideas of Plan B and C by the June board meeting. In fact, Katie Harley, who's, who is our event and strategic partnership coordinator will actually be attending several virtual league conferences in the weeks to come. And we'll be learning from other leagues around the country about how they executed those virtual conferences, how much they cost, how much they generated in revenue, which will then help inform those discussions around B and C. But we felt like it would be easier to give you a budget that included plan A, which would be the biggest budget, knowing that if we had to come back and amend it, to do plan B or plan C with annual, we would be shrinking that portion of the budget. Nick, will you go back up to the top of the memo? We also operated on the, on the dues freeze that you put in place last month. Uh, between the dues freeze and the uncertainty around the convention revenue, we have a third piece that becomes really interesting and that is the question around our, our um, fund balance. So back last August, uh, the board adopted a policy that said we must have an unrestricted cash balance of between 25 and 50% of the budget. We're currently projecting that unrestricted cash balance to be by the end of June at 54%, which means we have to spend budget reserves this coming fiscal year in order to get under the 50% amount. So in order to be consistent with our policies, we have to spend reserves. We also need to spend reserves because we have a healthy amount in that, that rainy day fund. 
and at the same time we are cutting our ongoing expenses to reflect the um, the dues the freeze in the dues and the uncertainty around sponsorship revenue and conference related revenue so what you see before you is a budget that brings together all of these unique aspects you see a decrease in ongoing revenue of seven percent um, then you see on top of that, an addition of one time $220,000. In fact, I was joking with some staff that I was tempted to, to do this in a Lyle Hilliard or a Francis Gibson voice where I talk about ongoing funds versus one-time funds and structural imbalance. But and then I realized the only one who would really laugh at that would be Roger. And even then after all the tax reform hearings from last summer, I'm not even sure Roger would be laughing. And I don't have his face in front of me here to see even if he laughs, I missed my moment there. But we have a similar situation. Ongoing revenue, we're tightening the belt, but we do have one-time dollars that we can use for one-time projects. And that combined means that the budget we're proposing to you is $2.912 million. So $2,912,500. And $2 so the Memo then articulates where the revenues are coming from and where the major changes are in expenses. Before we go into that, are there any questions about how we put these big pieces together around membership dues, the uncertainty around conferences, and the reserves? Okay, if, Mr. President, if there are no questions, then I'll just uh, I'll just continue. So the fund balance amount we're contemplating pulling over is about two hundred is two hundred and twenty thousand dollars. And as we come in here to the memo in part two, you'll see that you'll see where we end up investing that two hundred twenty thousand dollars. Within the expenses, the world has changed internally at the league over the last twelve months when you last set the budget. 12 months ago, the position that Katie Harley now fills did not even exist, the event and strategic partnership co coordinator. But as a result of the strategic planning last fall, uh, we have invested in that position and, and Katie's done a terrific job handling a variety of duties, including all of our live event advocacy over the last few weeks with the Utah Leads Together plan. And then she's been leading the effort preparing for the annual convention in September. Because of her new position and because of adjustments to the Director of Government Relations, uh, Victoria taking that position in January, there was going to be an independent uh, increase in the personnel budget independent of COVID, um, just by virtue of having an additional staffer and the adjustments we made to the Director of Government Relations position in order to recruit uh, someone of the caliber of Victoria and we're grateful to, to have her on the team. As, as we went through the personnel section, we, we do intend to make some reductions to contract labor, though uh, we actually think that that number may go down further as, as we go into the year, but at least as of now, we're, we're projecting a decrease of 14,000. So the overall personnel budget would go up about 4%. That does mean we're not proposing any cost of living increases in staff salaries. Uh, we did, uh, coordinate with the Utah City Managers Association to get an idea of what was happening in cities around the state. And, and based on the survey results from UTMA, it looked like over two thirds of cities were not doing any sort of, of cost of living increases. And so at this point, uh, we're planning on matching that uh, and, and being consistent with what we're seeing in the public sector. But the good news is we are planning on retaining every, every employee, which is not the case in, in a lot of sectors right now. Let me stop there to see if there are any questions around personnel. Okay. Then Mr. President, I'll just keep going. One weird thing about Zoom is feeling like you're just talking to yourself, and, but I will assume that, that silence is actually a good thing in this, in this situation. When you get to the section C of the memo, you'll see that we are and proposing decreasing our ongoing expenses. So this is the tightening of the belt and reflecting the overall decrease in revenue of the budget. Uh, but this is also where you'll see the infusion of the reserves. 
uh, we wanted to make it crystal clear that the reserve money coming in was not to cover ongoing expenses, but to address one-time items in the upcoming year budget. So for example, $100,000 would come from reserves and we put it into what we're calling the annual convention contingency fund. This is, this is to make sure we have a buffer to run a conference, even if we are not able to do an exhibit hall, even if we're not able to have any sponsors to participate, because if we go all virtual, we could see sponsors saying, wait a minute, we paid you to sponsor, we paid you to have two events, you canceled mid-year, and now you're going all virtual at annual. Uh, we feel like this would give us enough of a buffer to still be able to do what we need to do during a convention, even if there was no private sector uh, money involved. Um, so that's 45% of the reserve money. Um, Nick, keep going down. You'll also see that, no, actually go back up a little bit, the facility, and special equipment rental, you'll see that we combined those categories, uh, seeing that they, they historically were treated separately. And as we've gone back to try to look at all the historic data, there's no real rhyme or reason as to why some things were in facility rent and some things were in special equipment. And so that's why we're proposing combining them in this upcoming year. So that's all in that one category. Uh, Nick, keep going down to section D. Here's the other big piece of the reserves. It's this new category that we've entitled organization modernization. Over the last couple of years, you as a board have invested in the physical space of remodeling the headquarters. You've invested in a new website that we plan to unveil this fall. So we look at that as, uh, as we've remodeled the house and we have now, and we're now upgrading the front door. Well, the last piece of this whole modernization piece, which has become crystal clear over the last couple of months, has been the, the engagement infrastructure. So that would be everything from our convention software to ability to run webinars, to the fact that we're still mainly using spreadsheets on the back end of, of tracking who attends events. And there are a bunch of data and membership um, software companies out there that could be really beneficial to us to be more efficient as an organization. And so we felt like this would be a natural next step, use the one-time dollars to invest in those types of programs, and then it would be part of the, the annual ongoing budget to just keep those up and running, and it would replace some of the antiquated things that we're still doing. Uh, and again, it would, we would use the reserve dollars to invest in that, similar to what we did last year where we used reserve dollars exclusively in order to redesign the website. Are there any questions about sections uh, C and D? In that case, Nick, will you run down to the actual budget items? So keep going. Here's where you can see a comparison to the last couple of years, along with the fiscal year 2021 tentative budget, and you can look at the revenues where we're projecting the decrease in revenues. And again, this is with option A, which is an in-person convention with mitigation. You, so you can see where we're anticipating the decreases in revenue next year. The decrease in publications is simply because we print every other year our two major publications. So, you know, that number always fluctuates every other year. Um, Nick, go down to the expenses side. Now, within the expenses side, you'll see that we've made a concerted effort through the operating and program expenses to re uh, revisit every receipt and every dollar that we've spent over the last couple of years and identify efficiencies. Now, one example that, that I think is, is really important here is in that first section of operating and programming expenses, third from the bottom is building utilities. So you can see in our building utilities that we were fiscal year 19, $6,516. That was while we were in the temporary space. We budgeted 8,000, not sure what the, because last year at this time, we weren't hundred percent sure what the costs were going to be going into the new space. Well, this year we're pleased to note that our utilities have been dramatically down. And that's even with a little bit of wiggle room for the fact we haven't been using utilities for the last few weeks because people have been working from home. So part of that is switching providers. Part of that is overall efficiency of the building. 
and we we're now pleased that we've been able to save several thousand dollars there and we've been able to do that really across the line we invested in in equipment a couple of years ago so therefore the you know the purchases can go down a little bit and we've seen that so so we feel comfortable with some of the cuts that we're making in the ongoing expenses side and then you can see there's still a lot of movement in the convention programming uh, which is down near the bottom uh, and then the external policy research and outreach um, amicus brief program and the like that you know we still want to keep those programs strong but most of those have just started in the last year or so and we want to still make sure that they are they're vibrant even as we make some tweaks to them this year that in a nutshell is the is the tentative budget nick is there anything you would like to add from the coo perspective Um, yeah, I would just add that uh, Cam and I went through, as Cam's emphasizing, the cuts we've made in um, operating and program programming expenses. We noted uh, last year in the tentative budget, and we mentioned it again this year in the memo, um, that we're working on some working from some old data that doesn't give us a whole lot of info. Uh, but as we've gone forward, we've uh, gotten a better understanding of these uh, categories. And we feel pretty comfortable that we'll be able to uh, accomplish our mission uh, the same as we have with these program cuts. Um, it, like Cam mentioned at the beginning, it is a little strange to uh, go cut a budget by $200,000 and then um, throw $200 back into it because we have to spend down our reserves. But as we look through what we're trying to accomplish, um, we think this budget is really going to help us in um, fiscal year 21. Um, if there are any specific line item questions that people have or want to know our history in there, why we're projecting, um, just go ahead and ask me and I can get you uh, some deeper numbers to, to go ahead and look at that. But um, we think this will work well for us and um, happy to present it to you today. Mr. President, we'll turn it back over to you. Perfect. Thanks, Cam. Thanks, Nick. Good work. Uh, good work on navigating uh, through some weird times for sure in in a, in a budget scenario. Is there any um, any questions from the board? Any questions or comments uh, about uh, item number six, uh, the 2021 tentative budget? Uh, I just make the comment, uh, Mr. Uh, President, uh, thanking staff. For working through this um, just as in our cities this is a Herculean effort to basically do all this twice this year so thanks Cameron and Nick and everyone involved you bet thank you mr. chair can I also make a comment this is Aaron yes that, please, uh, mayor. I, I'm grateful for the staff's approach and for their tenacity to make sure that we're managing our funds the way the best way we can and in an appropriate way and I even though I wasn't on the board some years ago as a council member um, you know I was participating in the league and I have just such a dramatic contrast and trust for the management of the league's budget um, and not because I'm a board member necessarily but the the way that our staff is helping us handle and make prudent decisions. I, I just appreciate it so much. Mr. Thank Chair, you. Jeff, Thank you, Mayor. Now. I'll make a motion to tentatively adopt the tentative budget. I'll second, Mayor Caldwell. Thank you, Mayors. Uh, we have a, a, a motion by Mayor Silvestrini, a second by Mayor Caldwell to approve the 2021 tentative budget. Uh, along with the memo associated with it. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Just, just to opposed. clarify, that we just adopted the tentative budget, right? We didn't tentatively adopt it. Just checking, Mayor Silvestrini. I thought it was appropriate to tentatively adopt it, wait the public hearing, and then uh, that's the procedure I usually follow. We usually do an adoption yep. of a tentative budget. That's how we do it as well. But I don't yeah, know. we'll be doing the public we'll be doing the public hearing in June, 
and then you'll approve the final the final budget in June. So whether it's if you whether you tentatively approve it today uh, or approve the tentative budget, I think you're fine. I think you're fine either way. The general message is that this is now what we're operating on for that June meeting, but there may be some tweaks as we continue working through the convention related portion of the budget. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks. Anybody uh, opposed to that motion? Perfect. That passes. The uh, tentative budget is tentatively adopted. How about that? We'll cover both sides of that. Uh, let's go item number seven, uh, the COVID-19 update. Cam, you want to direct us on where we're going here? Yes, thank you. And there are a lot of moving pieces, um, even just in the last few days. So before we, we jump into the, the policy discussion here, we do need guidance from you as a board. And we talked about this some a couple of weeks ago, but now we have actual bills and concepts in front of us. And so uh, we have people who are waiting on direction from the league. And so this is a, the next hour or so will be critical as we walk through each of these main items. Before I start on the federal piece, I'm actually just going to rearrange the first two bullet points and start with the what we refer to as orange with, or yellow with the shade of orange. And the majority of the state is now in a state of yellow, the key exceptions being Salt Lake City, West Valley City, Grand County, Morgan County, and Summit County. And those jurisdictions remain in orange at least for this week and will be reevaluated as we move on. So everybody knows because the league office is located in Salt Lake City, uh, and it is still orange in Salt Lake City. League staff is still working from home at this point. Um, on a personal note, I plan to continue working from home um, even beyond this week because my wife is, is due in two weeks. And so we've been uh, sequestered as much as possible to make sure that, that nothing happens uh, with, with, the up, with the upcoming baby. Uh, and then we as staff will be reevaluating basically on a on a regular basis as the color code shifts in, in Salt Lake City. But at this point, staff's working from home. The um, This morning, the governor had his weekly call with the Economic Response Task Force. And the focus of the call was why we're in yellow now and what the potential timing will be around green. I want to just hit a few key highlights from that call because it will set up the policy discussion and the advocacy discussion that we need to have. First, on the health side, he walked through the four phases, the transmission rate, hospitalization, the ability to detect the undetected, and the exposure source, and explained how Utah had met the criteria of 14 to 21 days of, of positive news in all four of those categories in order to move to yellow. So we'll move to green once the data comes back even better than it currently is. He did not put a timing on it other than just to say that he hoped during the summer in a matter of weeks that the state could go green and there was, he was open as the data came in to other regionalized or localized modifications. Um, he did not talk specifically about Salt Lake City, West Valley City, or the three counties on the call. So the call was really focused on the areas that are in the state of yellow. He indicated that later this week, probably Wednesday, that Utah Leads Together 3.0 will come out. And there's been a lot of confusion because of the way the Utah Leads Together has been categorized. For example, his order last week referred to Utah Leads Together 2.0, but with the appendix 4.3. So uh, I even made this mistake a couple weeks ago where I referred to Utah Leads Together 4. In actuality, it's still Utah Leads Together 2, but the appendixes that are being added to it with all of the recommendations are up to 4.3. Utah Leads Together 3.0 will come out on you know, the tentative date of Wednesday of this week. And the major changes within 3.0 are going to be really fourfold. First, focus on high-risk in individuals and mitigation for high-risk individuals, and there are actually five categories that they'll define within Utah Leads Together. Those five categories range from those in state custody to those who are in assisted living centers, those who care for 
people in in care centers, uh, employees, and those and those who are uh, living at home and are you know the proverbial shut-in type um, type individual. So there'll be recommendations around those five categories. The second big piece that we'll talk about in more detail in a moment is how to make the CARES Act dollars as efficient as possible at the state and local levels. The third piece uh, is the revitalization component and how to get back on to economic recovery. And these revitalization principles, they listed several of them. I won't read you all of them, but within the revitalization principles, they talked about maximizing the federal dollars. And the big one I want to emphasize here is bonding for transportation for shovel-ready projects. So later this week, 3.0 will come out and it will talk specifically about the investment of CARES Act dollars and we'll talk specifically about shovel-ready projects and state bonding for transportation. And both of those will have direct impacts on local government. The governor also talked about the overall economic impact and how Utah compares with the rest of the country. Juliet Tennert was uh, part of the presentation this morning and she'll be presenting at our town hall this afternoon. A couple of key sneak peeks though for you is that while the national unemployment rate right now is estimated to be above 18%, which is higher than any time since the Great Depression, Utah is about half of that and has been stabilizing over the last few weeks. In fact, Juliet will show some data later today that shows that the number of new claims has steadily gone down over the last month. Likewise, they have a, an indicator that will be in the plan about the negative economic impact of COVID on Utah, and the negative economic impact is about 9.6%. The national average is 21%. So again, Utah is very well positioned, all things considered, and not seeing the same level of negative impacts that we're seeing in other parts of the country. Let me stop there and just see if there are any questions about the yellow, the shade of orange, before I before I, I move on to um, some of the public survey data we've collected. I've got a question. Yep, yeah, right go ahead, Mayor. For communities that are still in orange and haven't yet moved to yellow, is it a possibility that the governor with the publishing of this 3.0 um, will move us? He was silent this morning about the jurisdictions that are currently in orange. So it didn't come up. He didn't bring it up and none of the questions came up around the ones that are still in orange. It really was more of a focus on yellow and what 3.0 will mean in those other parts of the state. Is that so a that's question something that we could that, ask? Um, yep, in fact, tonight I'll be sending over the list of questions to the Lieutenant Governor for tomorrow's call. I'm happy, I'll make a note right now to add to the questions for the Lieutenant Governor tomorrow of the status around the current orange communities. Okay, and for what it's worth, just um, down here in our neck of the world, um, that the Park Service is kind of planning to reopen May 29th for Arches and Canyonlands, but our health department has started to make exceptions and move certain things from orange to yellow, including um, swimming pools at hotels. So, um, and I think everyone's pretty happy about that here in Moab. So for what it's worth, that's not a scary thing to, you know, it's uh, like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that we should advocate to stay orange. Like if the governor, you know, I want to I want to follow the governor's plan. So um uh that's that's just feedback for that if that's helpful. Perfect. Cameron, this is Matt Durham from Holiday. Have you heard anything about plans by the legislative commission to modify the um guidelines under yellow the yellow category in terms of um, protocols for individuals, high-risk individuals, businesses, et cetera? The Utah Leads Together 3.0 plan will have a section on high-risk individuals that will, I, 
No, I don't know for sure how they'll overlap with the current appendixes, if they're going to update the appendixes or what the sequence is there. So let me add that to my list to follow up with um, the commission staff around that. Hey, Cameron, I have a question that's been brought up uh, a fair amount as I've talked with local businesses. Um, the question that has come up quite a bit is um, about supplies. So one of the things that as, as restaurants especially are opening, being able to get sanitized equipment and the basic equipment that would be required. I've had multiple small businesses that they've really struggled from the supplier standpoint and asked if there was any... Um, talk about that or any way that that there could be options for businesses to say get the stuff that they need so that they can open up and uh, the feedback i've received from the business side uh truthfully coming into today off of the weekend talking to multiple businesses is uh it's it's pretty despair wow like the numbers that these local businesses have been giving is absolutely just mind-boggling and the big debate is, and question is, is how in the heck are they going to pull out of this? That was so. Thank you, Mayor. That issue was highlighted in last week's governor's call on Monday because of the concern around the state on supply chains. Uh, Teresa Foxley has been leading a subgroup around supply chains. We've been involved in it, and the the coordination has been to enhance the local supply chains through the State Department of Health, distributing through the local health departments, and so using the local health departments as a conduit of information. So if, if you're seeing a shortage in your community, making sure your health department knows so they can report to the state health department of where the shortages are, so that they in turn can be connected with the Manufacturers Association and other local businesses that have turned their business in recent weeks to focusing specifically and exclusively on PPE and sanitation equipment. So do you know if those conversations are happening with, with uh, Lloyd Berenson? Uh, one of the questions that was brought up that I actually wasn't sure, I had heard that and, and I had had some conversations with Lloyd about that and he said that they were getting information on, on how to exactly address that. I got asked if, if the retailers themselves should be going uh, to the health department to to voice that or if that should be coming through the elected body filtering through the health department to try to synchronize it and I, I actually wasn't sure on how to answer that. Yeah, that's a good question. Let me let me follow up this afternoon with Teresa or with uh, Jill Parker. Do you know Jill? She's up in your neck of the woods. Yes. Yeah, so let me follow up with her and just and and with Teresa and, and find out if they want the business, front end business to just make the request or if they want it to come through the the local government. Um, I, yeah, let me find out what they want that protocol to be. Perfect, thank you. So as we pivot to the advocacy piece, I wanna share a, four quick tidbits of of research. Uh, number one, Nick, can you share the screen with that UDOT link that I sent? As Nick pulls this up, uh, Wasatch Trend Regional Council, UDOT, and others have been tracking the transportation trends over the last couple of months during COVID. There's a wealth of data but there, this one, uh, this one um, graph, I think, explains really nicely at least the, the short-term issue we're facing. Nick, any luck? Perfect. Can you go to go to? Um, so it says at the bottom one of nineteen. Just go to the next one. So this is one of many. You can go to UDOT's website and take a look at look at these. You can find them from around the state. 
the one I send Nick was just simply I-15 in Salt Lake County. And what you'll see here is year over year data from 2020 compared to 2019. You can see at the beginning of the year in January and February, we had major travel spikes with the exception of a few days in February. Uh, and everything was, almost everything was ahead of where we were last year. Then March arrived. You can see you have that spike in mid-March and then we almost overnight dropped to 81% year over year compared to 2019. And then you can see it bottomed out in end of March, beginning of April, where people were driving on I-15 in Salt Lake County at you know, the traffic volume was 42, 44, 45% of what it was a year ago. The numbers have steadily climbed up to where it was 80% over the weekend. And today seemed more normal on the freeways. But either way, you've got this, at the very least, a two month gap where the traffic flow has been significantly less than what it's been before. The bad news about that is that if people are driving less, that means that they are consuming less motor fuel. If they're consuming less motor fuel, that means less motor fuel tax revenue, which impacts all of our budgets. So keep this data point in mind when we come, come back to the advocacy stuff in a moment. The silver lining to this though, is that you've seen a major shift to telecommuting and working from home. So the second key research point is that we're partnering with UCARE and with Tom Carter on a telecommuting survey and uh, research outreach that will go in the field in the next week or two to get an understanding on the best practices around telecommuting. And one thing that has become clear in the calls I've been on with the governor and others is that there are many people, particularly in the tech sector, who have said that they plan to telecommute for the foreseeable future. In fact, one of the tech industry reps on the call this morning said, we don't think we will ever go back to the office again and referenced a bunch of high-end commercial real estate projects in Lehigh that right now are full. And they said, we're never going to use that space because it's so much easier to work from home. Our employees have liked it. Productivity hasn't gone down. We're, we're going to shift away from that permanently. And so that's going to have an impact on local government revenue and, and frankly, on land use as well. So, that, so watch for that telecommuting survey that will be coming to an email box near you in the next couple of weeks. The third interesting data point, the third and fourth data points that I want to share with you about this phase come from Y2 Analytics. We, we contributed to a survey that they put in the field a week ago. Uh, we paid for a handful of questions. It was a much broader survey, uh, but we paid for a handful of questions. One of the questions that we paid for was around whether or not the public felt comfortable attending city events, such as fireworks shows, festivals, parades, and the like. And then another question that we paid for, uh, another question that we paid for was around the overall trust and approval in local government. And then the other question we paid for dealt with federal advocacy. So let me talk first about the comfort level in attending live events this summer. 30, and just so you know, I got this data over the weekend, so it's not yet public. You're, you're getting it first, and then we need, we'll be figuring out as staff how we want to distribute it. And we are a fraction of the overall survey uh, that, that Utah Policy actually owns. They released some of those findings today, and they're going to be releasing findings over time, and they're waiting to hear from us if we want them to share some of these data points as well. So to the question of if you feel comfortable attending city events, 32% of people statewide said yes. They would be comfortable attending festivals, parades, fireworks shows, and the like. 32%, 68% said no. We, could, we broke that down by demographics. We broke that down by gender. We broke that down by location. And we broke that down by political ideology. On, here are some of the key highlights. By location, there was enough, significant enough data from the urban counties along the Wasatch Front and Washington County. And Davis County and Salt Lake County were the two lowest of comfort levels. Davis County was 25%, Salt Lake County 26%. Meanwhile, Mayor Pike, in your neck of the woods, 53% of your residents said they would feel comfortable attending fireworks shows, festivals, and the like. 
when we looked at some of the the demographics, I expected that people over 65 would be the least likely to feel com comfortable going to these events. That's not the case. They were the second least likely. The least likely, those aged 18 to 34, only 17% statewide said they would feel comfortable attending live events. Uh, that number peaked in the 40s when you got to people between mid 30s and mid 50s and then went back down in the 20s above age 55. Then as we looked at, at the political ideology, um, for those who were identified as independents or left of center, the numbers were way low. But if you identified as a, as a strong member of the Republican Party, 57% said they felt comfortable attending live events. So that's, that's one data point to give you a general sense of the public's sentiment about, about attending live events. The other question that we paid for in this realm is around the trustworthiness and rating the job of local officials. And you should take comfort in knowing that 74% of Utah statewide rate the job that city and town leaders are doing as excellent or good, 74%. Your trustworthy rating is at 58%. Um, I have been, I have seen the data for the governor, the president, the legislature, county health officials, and others, and I can't tell you those specific numbers because they don't belong to the league. I have been authorized to tell you though that your 74% um, of your of your job rating is consistent with the governor, and is more than 20 points higher than that of the legislature or the president. And then trustworthiness, same ballpark. Uh, people trust health officials uh, they, at the highest. They trust local business community and local government leaders and the governor. And then you have a sizable drop until you get to the trustworthiness of the legislature, president, and the federal government. So I wanted to give you all of that background information because th that's going to help us as we jump into this adv advocacy conversation of where we go on a few key things. So any questions about any of that data before we proceed? Okay, well, what we need to knock out here during advocacy is direction on the fourth stimulus, and now that there's a bill in front of us, and then there's quite a bit happening on the state level. So on the federal piece, uh, we'll tag team this between Wayne Bradshaw, Susan Wood, and me. Um, let's start, Susan, you've been involved in the National League of Cities um, communications effort around their Cities Are Central campaign. There are the Cities Are Central campaign materials in your packet. Susan, can you take a moment and just articulate what NLC is trying to accomplish with their campaign and what they're looking for from state leagues and from individual cities? Sure, Kim. I'll go over what they're asking from us. Could you first specify the numbers, what they're what they're wanting financially? Sure. The NLC ask of Congress right now is what you found in the Heroes Act, which is three hundred seventy-five billion with a B uh, dollars over two years for local governments, split between cities and counties. And Speaker Pelosi put that entire amount into the HEROES Act that Congress passed, or excuse me, the House of Representatives passed on Friday. Uh, but that's the, that's the scale of the ask so far. And it's not just for the HEROES Act. I mean, it's just, it, it just coincidentally happens to be that same amount, right, Cam? You're muted still. That's what they, that's what they asked of Speaker Pelosi and the House Democratic leadership, and she put in every dime of the ask. So it okay. wasn't a coincidence, that was specifically their ask. And what they want essentially is to get our get Congress to allocate numbers, I mean, appropriate numbers uh, to cover the losses from COVID in all of our cities and towns, regardless of the size nationwide. So they're asking basically a three part request for us to send, encourage and amplify uh, to get the message through. They would like us to send letters individually from city leaders to the delegation. Uh, they've created a toolbox or a toolkit, <coughs> excuse me, that has, that's uh, co-branded. So it has space for 
an individual logo, a city logo, or the league's logo with their Cities Are Essential logo, then they want us to take some sample language and modify it so that it's ours, the, that it comes from us, and send that to our congressional leaders. Then they would like us to encourage businesses and organizations in our community to do the same. And they want us to amplify this message by using social media and the toolkit that they've provided. They're giving us different size graphics for Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and the like. Was there a question? I guess I just heard some extraneous I'll ask, noise. Susan, I'll ask one. Uh, okay. where's, where's, the, where's this stuff available? Do you I will provide it. I'm going to be receiving it this afternoon. And then they also have with the toolkit sample media posts. And mind you, all of this can be modified. It's just sample language. Um, they've got profile picture overlays. So you could take their little profile background and put your picture in it on your Facebook page, if you so choose. Um, email banners, stationary, but it's all with the Cities Are Essential logo. So that's what the campaign includes in a nutshell, Cam. Perfect, thank you, Susan. As you know, I'm on the board of directors for NLC, so Susan's been heavily involved on the communication side. And then Wayne Bradshaw has been uh, our point person with the, with the delegation. Uh, Wayne, can you give an update on what we're hearing from the delegation around the HEROES Act specifically, but also just in general around uh, potential dollars for state and local governments? Yeah, thanks, Gam. So at our last board meeting, the board voted to support a four stimulus that provided direct funding to each municipality for infrastructure and critical services. So we have communicated that to our congressional delegation from staff to staff. And, um, and then the HEROES Act became available. And as, as Cam and Susan pointed out, it's $375 billion for local governments, but it's part of a $3 trillion um, package. And so the House voted on Friday. Uh, all of our House members voted no. They voted against the legislation. And from communication from our senators, uh, it also is a dead upon arrival in the Senate. And so there's going to be ongoing negotiations regarding um, what the final force stimulus looks like. Uh, we had Senator Romney on a town hall call on last Monday. Senator Romney expressed support for funding to local governments and direct funding to, to local governments. But he would like it to be data driven versus just a, a number that is distributed based on a, on a say a population formula or a community, community block grant formula. Um, he'd like to be more needs driven. Since then, I've had communication with Senator Romney's staff. And um, to earlier, earlier points in the conversation, we are having negative impacts here in Utah. And, and they are diverse across the state. But we're nowhere near impacted um, some other states when it comes to lost revenue. And so uh, Senator Romney's office has, has expressed concern that uh, there may not be enough data to support a significant um, direct allocation. And so that is the last communication. We're still, we still have ongoing uh, conversations um, about, about the offices supporting some type of local funding. But um, Cam, did you wanna to touch on what Senator Lee's office had to provide? Sure, in our outreach to Senator Lee, uh, we were initially disappointed to find that he'd sent a letter to the president Explain, articulating his opposition to any more dollars for state and local governments. And you've seen a couple of our House members who've also latched on to the hashtag reject bailouts. As I talked to Senator Lee's staff, they were more nuanced in their position with me and they said, we oppose bailouts of bad pension systems in Chicago and Illinois. And I said, yep, uh, the Utah League does as well. And they said that they would be open to supporting a bill that had state and local government assistance uh, that was more narrowly tailored. And I told them what your motion was from a couple of weeks ago. And this was bef this conversation happened just as the HEROES bill came out. And I said, we don't have a position yet on HEROES, but here are the principles that we have. You'll see the slide that Nick has pulled up here, both uh, the policy side, this would be the largest spending bill in federal government history, if not maybe global history. Uh, I don't know how much the Marshall Plan was in relative dollars, but 
it, the HEROES Act is a, is a huge bill, and the direct allocation piece is about 11% of that overall bill, uh, which is in part why we as staff uh, told dele delegation staff members last week we didn't have a position on it because our portion is such a small overall portion. The politics are fascinating. Friday afternoon, I was on a call with state league directors from around the country, and NLC has hired a law firm in DC that specializes in Republican politics, particularly in the Senate. And the point person for NLC is the former chief of staff to Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. So the information I'm about to share with you, I ask that you keep amongst us and whoever's listening. Uh, what the majority, what the former chief of staff said is that even though the Senate has said the HEROES Act is dead on arrival, that they are indeed going through all 1800 pages of it, looking for items that they like. And he thought that there would be a significant amount of the HEROES Act that could end up in a compromise consensus bill. Certainly not $3 trillion worth, but he thought a lot could end up there and that state and local government dollars were near the top of the list. Expects there to be a regular committee process so you're looking at a mid to late June for a vote. You won't have the same sense of urgency that we saw with the previous stimuluses. And he said that in Senate caucus, Republican caucus, everyone is very leery of the president and where the president is going to be. Uh, and that the Senate Republicans who are open to assisting state and local governments have one, one word that they keep repeating, which is data. They want data about what the impact is of COVID on their communities. And that's where we're in a week a weird spot in Utah that Senator Romney has, is a key target for the National League of Cities. He has expressed his openness to us, but we're not in the same economic situation as the, as the rest of the country. And then the other key tidbit was around the messaging. The NLC lobbyists recommended not supporting the HEROES Act publicly. This was his recommendation to state leagues and instead said, focus your messaging on essential services, economic stimulus, and stabilizing businesses, um, and, and get that, that data collected. So our recommendation to you as a board would be to not take a position on HEROES, to follow this playbook that the NLC lobbyists laid out on, on Friday afternoon, uh, and then coordinate with, uh, with the two senators around, around data. All four House members voted against HEROES on Friday, uh, though several of them have told us quietly that they are supportive of more money for state and local governments, but just not in the form of the overall HEROES Act. So, Mr. President, that's our report on the federal side, open to discussion and a motion of how to proceed from here. Thanks, Cam. Does anybody have... Uh... Any questions or direction that they'd like uh, they'd like to discuss with the board uh, on what's been presented there? So, Mr. Chair, Jeff Silverstein, I don't know. Maybe we're going to get to this later. I don't know, Kim, if you've talked about it, but I it, it's relevant to talk here about um, efforts that that um, Commissioner Stevenson and I, on, as uh, chair and vice chair of the uh, Wasatch Front Regional Council, have had with our delegation. Um, We've talked really more about stimulus for transportation projects, but we did, you know, also mention that local governments were going to experience a revenue loss. And, and in the context of transportation, um, that's important because a lot of local governments will, will, you know, try to preserve the critical services they provide and um, and pay overtime for first responders and that and the sacrifice may be in the form of capital projects and you know that puts us behind the eight ball with respect to road maintenance and makes makes all those things more expensive if we don't get revenue replacement with respect to you know tran transportation infrastructure so we we talked to them of all we, you know we talked with staff mainly except for representative curtis was was there we talked to all six of them and uh presented a letter that wfrc uh, board approved as well as uh um other you know, metropolitan planning organizations across the country have written similar letters. But we, we talked about how, you know, coming out of the recession in 2008, you know, you know, Utah used, uh, used transportation spending as a stimulus to get out of, out of that problem. And as a result of that spending, 
in Utah that that the impact of that Great Recession was was you know less severe than it may have been in other places. And and we said that's a good formula for for this one as well. Um, and that um, and not only does uh, does will this will, will additional spending for transportation um, stimulate the economy, but it also accomplished some of the goals that I think we all share about improving infrastructure generally for our for our economic competitiveness in the global economy. So we, we made a pitch for that, um, for revenue replacement, and, and we also made a pitch for the fact that those funds should be um, administered in a logical way. We recommended that, that we use the regional transportation plan that metropolitan planning organizations or UDOT have developed so that the, the money goes to projects that are, have already been vetted and been through a community process or a regional process so that so that they're good projects as opposed to you know wasting the money on things that aren't valuable so anyway that's a that's another lobbying effort that's been going on um, you know we talked about some other things too because there's some there's a reauthorization of a of the of the start or fast bill which is uh, you know like long term federal spending on infrastructure and, and which which needs to be reauthorized in September so we talked about that as well but I think that 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 information may inform people with respect to what the league decides to do relating to federal stimulus for transportation or other or lost revenue. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. And, and Mr. President, I'll add that part of the reason I brought up 3.0 to preface this conversation is that by the end of the week, the, the state will be on record with 3.0 about using transportation, state transportation dollars as, as a stimulus, and that has been part of the behind the scenes discussion at the federal level too, is how much do you use transportation as a stimulus versus how much do you provide in a direct allocation? So all these pieces, all these pieces fit together. Thanks, Cam. Any, anybody else uh, have a comment or question uh, regarding this? Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm interested in what people think um, just kind of philosophically and, and I guess, you know, the projections um, as, it, as it relates to projections, um, as we lobby to, to, uh, to, re to be able to receive um, these, these funds. Um, and I, 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 I can kind of see the point of, of trying to use them as a stimulus uh, and, and especially for critical kinds of uh, transportation uh, needs. Um, does it give anyone pause though to, I mean, I, it's been spoken several times in terms of the true needs versus, and stimulus versus just, you know, I guess wants, you know. Uh, does it give, any, give anyone pause and, and how much, you know, we ought to be, um, I guess, requesting uh, versus hoping we could get back to some version of, of normal sooner than later and and that we we don't need to be mortgaging our kids future how much i know there's obviously some thoughts about that but just curious about this group what our thoughts are thanks mayor i i guess um from my perspective is that the uh the intention of of where the league would be on something like this, Cam, is is the opportunity for cities to engage individually uh, with the delegation. As maybe uh, I'm a little bit with you, Mayor Pike. I hope I hope that's what gets ironed out in the legislation a little bit better and says, okay, what's the critical needs uh, to get us, uh, y you know, to make sure cities are functioning and we're we're safe uh, and uh, and that we can keep essential services going for our residents uh, of our communities. But, but you're right, uh, the, the, the idea of everything being solved uh, from a government perspective, just because the federal government can print money, should they always, um, you know, just my personal, personal uh, bias there. But, uh, the, and I've had that discussion with business owners in the community of, uh, you know, you guys can just keep printing, printing money and taking money. I've got to keep making money. So, in in some ways, they they want to, 
want us to get out of their way as much as possible and, and obviously do it in a safe way. Mr. President, yeah. this is Cam, this is Cam again. And one other Y2 data point we paid for that I think fits nicely with Mayor Pike's question is we asked about federal efforts to date. We wanted to get a sense of what residents thought about the stimulus packages. So the question was, has, has the federal government done enough to help small business? Have they done enough to help big business? Have they done enough to help state and local government? And the answer, federal efforts, um, residents do not believe, or let me phrase it correctly. Uh, they believe the federal efforts have not been enough for small business, 63%. So 63% respondents felt like the federal government has not yet done enough to help small business. By comparison, 11% feel like they have not yet done enough to help big business. And state and local governments, right in the middle, 40% feel like the federal government has not done enough to help state and local governments. Mayor, Men Mayor Mendenhall, I believe I saw your hand up. So President, you wanna catch your distant cousin? Oh yes, <laughs> perfect. Go ahead, cousin. Thank you, cousin. Uh, I wondered back to the state potential for shovel-ready transportation projects. Are trails being contemplated? Um, even, uh, I think it goes to uh, Mayor Silvestrini's point about looking at the, the unified plan, a regional plan. There's a lot of interconnection opportunities between counties, um, but certainly here in our foothills in Salt Lake City, we just com completed our foothill trail master plan. Are trails a possibility in that funding potential? Mayor, this is Cameron again, and the 3.0 document that I saw well, four hours ago now, yes. Uh, active transportation and outdoor recreation uh, were both referenced within the possibilities of shovel-ready projects. Uh, so, and, and we'd heard rumbles of, rumbling about that, but, but it was in the draft document that I saw a few hours ago. Uh, to that end, Victoria, do you want to take a moment to, well, I guess Mayor Pike still has a question out there, but then Victoria can give an update on this transportation stimulus discussion that's going on, President. So after you feel like Mayor Pike's question's been answered, uh, Victoria can provide some more context on that other front. Cameron, you know, I realize mine too, it's pretty philosophical. I don't necessarily expect an answer. It's just, um, it's one I've been grappling with and, you know, the things that are critical and that would help us rebound versus the things that maybe aren't so critical and we could wait a year and a half or two for, I guess that's where I was going. Doesn't need to necessarily be answered. I realize that's a big philosophical question. Well, and, and I can weigh in on it too. I mean, I, 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 I think we all kind of share the, the idea of not, you know, uh, you know, borrowing from our children or grandchildren's future on this. But the, but the other piece of that, I think, is listening to economic experts. When you hear the chairman of the Fed talking about how this could be could turn easily turn into a serious recession. You know, there are consequences. There, there. Are, I, I would hate to, I would hate to have the consequence of that as a result of not uh, doing a, a stimulus. And you know, is three billion, three trillion too much? I'm so used to billions. You know, yeah, <laughs> probably right. And so, and so, I mean, getting to the ultimate question here, I'm comfortable in having our board not necess not support the Heroes Act per se. But I do think that there are that the policies inside of that or 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 that could be inside of whatever comes out of Congress, like a stimulus for transportation, because because we do need to spend more on our infrastructure. We all know that, you know, um, so and, and whether we borrow to do it, I don't know. But we got to we have to find some way to to fund that. Um, and so I think it, I think a better policy for us is, is not necessarily come out and endorse this particular house you know, of representatives proposal, but, but to look at, at the things inside of that that we think are worthy, like a transportation stimulus, in my opinion. Thanks, Mayor. I think that's a good point. Thanks, Mayor Silvestrini uh, and Mayor Pike. Victoria? Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, so last meeting, we introduced this idea um, where the Association of Counties and Wasatch Front Regional Council were looking at a state, not federal, state transportation stimulus type concept that would help with the loss of motor fuel tax revenues. And 
obviously, since we met last, the issue has ripened, and so we're back here with a little more clarity to get direction from all of you on um, this particular concept. Um, and as Cam said, apparently the governor and ledge leadership has been talking about it. There was an article in the Desert News yesterday if you want to look at that. But in your packet, um, we have a revised draft of this letter from Association Counties, WFRC and Mount Land Association Governments and the League um, for you to give us direction on if you want to send it out. And this, the draft in your packet today is different than the draft last time. The letter is basically highlighting the issue of the uh, motor fuel tax revenue being, um, you know, significant losses in that this year that we're expecting and asking the legislature to partner with local government on solutions for um, those kind of deficits we're looking at so that there can continue to be road maintenance and potential capital projects paid for in your respective cities and revenues for those in this upcoming year. And the idea being that these projects can help, you know, do a jump start to the economy as well. The partnership might look like a state bond um, with some bond revenues paying for state projects and other revenues going towards the local projects. This would mean that local government would have to pay the debt financing unless the state was willing to pay that. Um, we don't think the state will be willing to also pay the debt financing, but there's always hope. Uh, it could also be a temporary change to the 70-30 split for the BSC road funds to increase the local share and then taking the state's revenues and backfilling those with state bonds uh, so that we keep those UDOT projects whole. So I'm gonna, I know Andrew's joined us and he's patiently been waiting, been waiting uh, Andrew Gruber with WFRC. Um, so I'll turn over to him to see, um, you know, what other input he wants to, to give, but we're looking to hear from you if you, at the end of the day, if you want to send this draft letter with the league's name on it in conjunction with the other organizations asking for this partnership with the state, and um, is this a priority for staff to work on? And are there any preferences that you have as far as this policy will look like, whether it's trying to change that 70-30 formula, if it's just asking for state bonding uh, to help backfill some of these revenues. Right now, the letter is fairly general. Uh, it's just asking for this partnership and highlighting the issue with the motor fuel tax and what this means to local governments. So uh, if, unless there's any questions for me, Andrew, feel free to jump in. Okay, well, thanks, Victoria, and hello to everybody. It's good to see you all. Obviously, you've already had a fair amount of discussion about uh, transportation infrastructure uh, investment. I'll make offer just a few brief comments about this, and then maybe Mayor Silvestrini, if, if, if you want to offer comments as well, as we've been talking about this, as you noted, in your capacity with uh, WFRC. That, I'll just note one of the nice things about the uh, WFRC-ULCT relationship is the um, healthy overlap that exists between our, uh, our membership. And so the coordination is really terrific. So we've talked in this conversation already about l significant lost revenues that you and the state are experiencing in motor fuel tax collections. Of course, exacerbated by sales tax collection declines, which many of you and the state use for transportation infrastructure investment. Um, we've also talked about, so there's revenue losses, and then we've also talked about the potential stimulative effect for economic recovery of investing in transportation. I think the concept that we're looking at and that, that the organizations that Victoria mentioned have been looking at is that if there was the ability for there to be some additional assistance provided, that it potentially could be flexible enough that at the local level, determinations could be made about the most prudent use of those resources. For one community, it may be that you would best use resources to replace lost revenue from motor fuel tax so that you can continue your maintenance, not defer maintenance projects that then would be more costly in the future. In another community, it might be 
that you would invest the money in capital projects, improvements to infrastructure that were already planned and contemplated, but now potentially you're contemplating delaying those, which of course would be um, exacerbate the economic problems that we're having right now. The, the reason we even got really going on this discussion about the state helping locals with transportation is because of this dialogue that is happening right now about the potential for additional state bonding for stimulus. And as Cameron already noted, the, um, the version uh, three of the, of the uh, recovery plan will address the possibility of additional infrastructure investment, not just transportation, uh, broadband, water, I mean, a whole variety of investments. And to Mayor Mendenhall's point, uh, trails, and we have provided already some priority information of planned regionally significant trails that our organizations have developed. Um, but if there is to be additional state authorization for bonding for infrastructure investment, our thought is that local governments should be able to benefit from that investment as well. In other words, it shouldn't just be investment in state transportation, there should also be a component that the locals are able to continue your projects, maintenance and or infrastructure investment as you go forward. As Victoria noted, there's a variety of approaches that could be taken to structure that. And we think that it may be beneficial to be a little um, uh, flexible in the approach there if funding could come perhaps via the BNC formula and for eligible BNC uses thereby benefiting everybody and giving that flexibility. The only one other point that I wanna make here, and then Mayor Silvestrini, I think I'll uh, see if you wanna fill in here at all, is that um, our suggestion, at least our recommendation is, our suggestion is that we should not say that we want to take money that would otherwise have gone to UDOT and then bring that over to the locals. We're not trying to rob Peter to pay Paul. There should be assistance provided for the state in their revenue losses and the locals in their revenue losses invest in all components of the infrastructure for rec economic uh, recovery and revenue replacement going forward. Mayor Silvestrini. Yeah, well, I'll just add that, you know, one of the things that we don't know about this that is, um, or the devil's in the details on it, is if the state were to issue bonds for transportation and give a fair amount of that money to local government for whatever, um, you know, how does that get repaid? You know, the state is, the state has to repay the bonds. And, you know, are, would they be making a deduction from future BNC distributions to pay that, the, the portion they give to locals back? Or is there another way to do it, like was mentioned, the, the possibility of altering the 70%, 30% formula temporarily, and maybe that would offer a replacement of those revenues that we're losing without you know being uh, seeing a future reduction to pay back a bond. I, we don't know, but but the the letter that's proposed, the language in there is non-committal on that. It's kind of general, so that it could go either way. And that 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 I guess that's just somewhere we have to keep our eye on um, if this goes through a special session or or something to to try to figure out where we want to be. And we might want to give our our staff at either either or both, you know, the league or Wasatch Front or, 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 or MAG or whatever, uh, whoever, any other regional planning organization or UDOT even if they represent a rural county, some kind of direction about how we feel about future repayment, I guess, um, because that may become an issue. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Mayor Silvestrini. Cam, any, any comments that you'd have on, on this topic? We're going to give you the the third overlapping issue, which is where we're at with CARES, and then we do need a motion or three motions from the board about how to proceed on the HEROES Act slash fourth stimulus, this transportation stimulus at the state level, and CARES. They all overlap. We only have so much political capital. Uh, you, you can't be fighting with one hand and asking for millions of dollars with the other. Uh, my quick two cents on the state transportation stimulus is that any changes to the BNC formula, even if they're temporary, 
make me nervous. And uh, Mayor Caldwell and I still have the scars on our backs from several years ago uh, with the BNC. And so uh, even if it's a temporary change, once you open that door to making a change, you never know if the door closes again. And back in 2007 was the last time the legislature made any changes to the, to the split. At the time, the state kept 75% of the motor fuel tax revenue and locals got 25%. We bumped to 30 in part to match the number of vehicle miles traveled on local roads, but we gave back a bunch of sales tax dollars to the state that were previously locally authorized. So there's always this question of like, what do you give up in return? Um, the second issue to think about is if the state were to include us in this package and they backfill the BNC, well, the two biggest impacts on your budget from coronavirus right now are gas tax and sales tax. So if the state were to backfill the gas tax, it decreases the ask of the federal delegation for the fourth stimulus, and we're already in a better shape, better shape than most other state leagues and most cities around the country. So what does that do to our ask of the delegation? And then Mayor Stilistrini hit on that key question about how locals repay the state. So I'll pause there and turn it back to Wayne, Mr. President, to give the update on the CARES Act, although I think Mayor Caldwell wanted to speak up. Yeah, Mr. President, can I just jump in really quick? I asked this to Andrew earlier. One of the uh, devil in the details comments that gets me worried is how do they define shovel ready? I told Andrew I define shovel ready as what my dog leaves in the front yard in the morning. But in terms of transportation, infrastructure that can be defined you know a dozen different ways and it's a way to give hope in the immediate when we're all in a crisis mode but they can put so much regulation and other things in there that it really just freezes us all out so i, I want to know more about how they define that and and how, what we can do as a community before we put a whole bunch of time and energy into chasing after what just may be a ghost Thank Thanks, you, Mayor. Mayor. President, can we turn it over to Wayne to do a quick update on CARES, and then we'll look for motions from the board on these three items? Yep, go ahead, Wayne. Okay, thank you. Just as a quick reminder, um, at the last board meeting, we talked about there are three pools of funds um, for local government that came from the CARES Act. The first one is state has $246 million, Salt Lake County has about $203 million, and Utah County had $111 million. Uh, the board encouraged us to look at the 246 to provide funding, direct funding to all counties and cities um, that had not received any funding from the CARES Act. That includes cities and towns in Salt Lake and Utah County. We put together a formula and presented that to legis legislators from the Executive Appropriations Committee, the Governor's Office, and, and other staff, and that was rejected. They, suggested that um, cities and towns within Salt Lake and Utah County should receive direct appropriations from the county's allotment. Um, so where we're at today is the state plans on distributing their $246 million to counties and cities outside of Salt Lake and, and Utah counties. Um, it, the, they'll do it in three tranches. The first one will be in June. The second one will be um, this late summer, and then the last one will be in the fall. The first tranche will be population-based. So for each resident within your city, that will be about $29 a resident in the first tranche. The second tranche could be at that same level. And then the third tranche, we are anticipating um, adjusting the formula depending on hotspots, actual need, um, and other unforeseen impacts. For Salt Lake County, uh, cities and towns, Salt Lake, has, Salt Lake County has committed to provide direct funding based on population for the first tranche, still negotiating the second and third tranches. In Utah County, they are going to reimburse cities based on um, actual expenses, um, excluding things like economic revitalization, which is allowed under Treasury and federal guidance, but they would like to retain that at the county level. Um, now, in the, we presented, this was presented at the Executive Appropriations Committee. It was expressed by the uh, Senate President and the Speaker of the House that they would like to see county, cities 
in Salt Lake and Utah County to be treated equitably, just how the state is going to treat cities outside of those counties. So that message was heard. Salt Lake County has adapted, Utah County has not. Um, ultimately, what we're looking for from the board is, do we go back to legislators and ask them to apply more pressure on Utah County? Or do we put our efforts somewhere else when, you know, to the, say the transportation conversation and wait until this first tranche goes out and see what, that, what happens in Utah County and come back and revisit this? Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Wayne. I know we have a few Utah County mayors that have been pretty involved in these discussions. Mayor Kafusi, Mayor Fulmer, uh, any, any insights from uh, any discussions you've had so far, Utah County? Uh, this is Julie Fulmer. I think that right now at this point, and uh, Mayor Kafusi, correct me if I'm wrong, the mayors have kind of been working together and coming up with a plan and working with the county, and they sent out a memo this morning that most of the mayors down there seemed um, to approve of. Um, so I feel like as far as Utah County goes, I feel like they're making their way and feeling better about it. I don't know if Mayor Kafusi is available to add any insight there. Thanks, Julie. The, it's interesting because the email they sent out as I'm sitting here watching emails drop in from mayors, there still is a little bit of rub with Commissioner Ainge. Um, they're feeling that it's a lot of the same old as the money has to come, you have to come to us. Mother May I is actually a couple quotes I've gotten from a couple mayors that saying that is that what the commissioners are wanting us to still use the Mother May I? Um, so there is a little bit of contention at this point. I'm going into a meeting, well, right now with um, some people that want to talk to me about it in, this, in the county. So I feel like we're not there yet, but I don't know. I have mixed feelings. It's just all I'm going to say. Do you feel that? So I feel like maybe we're not there yet, but do you feel like we should keep advocating or do you feel like we're getting close? Because the last few conversations I had, I thought we were going to take a much different route than Commissioner Ainge put forward. And I was surprised to see so many people on board with the memo. Yeah. And that's the interesting thing, right? People are on board when they're on a call and then the emails, the truth comes flooding in through email about how they really feel. So what I'm doing is I'm just trying to get them to kind of man up and let's get to this and let's say what we feel and let them know. But right now there's definitely some unrest with where they landed with that email. And they called it a draft this morning that they sent out. And I've already heard back from two other mayors that are upset with it. So We'll see, and if it is truly a draft, then then I'm gonna encourage all the mayors to give feedback on this, this so-called draft. I think that's great because I was actually, when it first came through, I was really surprised that so many people even spoke out on the phone about it in agreement to it. But um, yeah, but I'd, I'd love to hear that feedback that comes in. I think um, just being uh, involved in some of those back and forth uh, in, in the emails and, and things, um, I hope we're working in the right direction in Utah County. I think the league has facilitated some level of that for us as elected officials, city elected officials in Utah County. Um, I think we continue to push in, in the right direction of, of encouraging them to follow uh, you know, follow what uh, what Salt Lake County's doing um, with with them following direction of the state. It would be odd for Utah County to be outside the, the boundaries there for sure. Um, I guess from from where I sit, the league has has helped where they could on that. Um, I am a little hesitant to continue to you know uh, maybe burn more political capital. Uh, at the state level 
for a county issue that I think I think us mayors, I think you mayor, former Mayor Kafuski and the mayors that are united in Utah County can do a lot of uh, the good work and heavy lifting that you've done already to, to get to get to especially Commissioner Ainge in the right place and, and get this to the right place. Um, so Wayne, to kind of answer your, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Mayor. Say Mayor Lawson is probably one of our most outspoken. So we'll just we'll get him on the your mayor. <laughs> I I told him to you know he's free to use the words they use in St. George sometimes, and we don't use them so often in Spanish Fork, and and uh, maybe he's used those a little bit. But uh, uh, to somewhat answer your question, Wayne, I I think I think where you've got us to helped us to as far as policy with the, with the county uh, in Utah, um, as, as governor likes to call it, the, the epicenter of dysfunction is, is where we're at. And we'll, we'll, we'll continue to try to uh, work united as, as mayors and council members in Utah County to get that in the right place. I think we're getting closer um, and, uh, and have you continue to focus on what you need to at the state level. Can I add real quick, if the Executive Approach Committee said that all cities need to be treated equitably along the Wasatch Front, they will probably be the hammer in some of that conversation as well. So, and, so, so there, why get out in front of, why, why be the hammer that we get hammered against, right, Mayor, if, uh, we, yeah. if we don't need to? Yep. And to Mayor Caldwell's point, um, you know, the state is expecting some reporting with how these funds are used after the first tranche so we can potentially adjust the second and third tranches um, and so we will be able to see after the first tranche how differently cities are being treated say in utah county versus across the state and we'll have a much cleaner picture to to demonstrate to um, those elected officials at the legislature that have expressed equitability so um, but we certainly want to be supportive as well throughout uh, the first tranche in Utah County. Perfect. Thanks, Wayne. Anything additional to add to that, Cam? No, I think we welcome the motion from the board around these three overlapping issues. The first being a, a motion around the, the HEROES Act. Again, our staff recommendation would be to not take a position on the HEROES Act but to still be supportive of, of state and local um, direct relief dollars uh, based on data, based on with the direct money to cities, have a, have a stimulative approach with how those dollars are, are spent so that, and then have some flexibility on how local governments can spend, can spend those dollars. Um, the second issue that overlaps with that is around the, the state stimulus and really a motion to support the draft letter in your packet uh, would get the job done and we can have that letter letter off with some of these devil in the details questions that we've we've raised. And then the third would be to essentially pump the brakes on our advocacy within Salt Lake and Utah counties and defer to the city leaders in those two counties to finish their negotiations with those counties now that we've helped set up the statewide policy and then we reevaluate uh, after the after the first tranche or the first in the case of the two counties the first distributions Wayne and Victoria did I miss anything or does that summarize where what we need no I think that's that hits it yep that was great Nick can you go down to slide six So actually go back to five actually. Can so just leave it there for, for a second. Did you want so to I think let's, solutions now? No, I'm thinking maybe Victoria, we, we take care of these three big ones, make sure we're on the same page and then you can jump into five and six. So, uh, okay, so uh, and Ms., Mr. Chairman, are you ready for a motion? And, and I guess on the HEROES Act, staff is recommending that we take no position. Is that correct? 
Yes, no position on the act itself, but supportive of the concepts within the state and local direct aid. And maybe your motion just says we're, we're not prepared to put a dollar amount yet on what the, what the need is both for cities in Utah and cities nationwide and just focus on on those principles but just that would give us more comfort when we're following up with the delegation and with the national league of cities about where we are at as an organization so mr chairman if you're so inclined i'll um i'll make a motion that we take no position on the heroes act but that we uh state that we support the concepts of local and direct aid as cameron just stated i'll second that that's aaron Thank you, Mayor. Mayor uh, Pike motion, Mayor Mendenhall second uh, to support the concept of the HEROES Act, but with no official position on the dollar amount uh, that, uh, that it would add up to for all cities in, in the nation and the state. Uh, with that motion, any question on the motion? Okay, perfect. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that takes us uh, to uh, the transportation uh, state stimulus uh, level and supporting the, the draft letter that's in your uh, that's in your packet there. Again, the key to that uh, that stood out to me was as you as we well know in our cities, putting putting stuff off as far as uh, state uh, or excuse me as far as road projects, transportation projects, can end up quite, costing us quite a bit down the road instead of maintaining what we have. I like that part of that letter. Uh, I would entertain a motion uh, to uh, su right. su supporting that. Yeah, so I make a motion uh, to for the board to approve the letter as written and to authorize uh, staff to send it to the persons to whom it's directed. Mayor Caldwell, second. Thank you, Mayor Silverstrini. Motion, Mayor Caldwell, second. On that front, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed on that? Perfect. Okay, the third one uh, that uh, that uh, we're talking about, the CARES Act, um, and uh, in, in in essence, uh, supporting what is at the, the state level of uh, distributing that $246 million out to the cities and counties that aren't Salt Lake and Utah County, and then uh, getting uh, some more information after this first tranche of money in Salt Lake and Utah counties goes out to the cities to see what uh, what pressing we need to do there uh, after that first tranche of money. Yep, and and from league perspective, backing off our advocacy in Salt Lake and Utah counties right now and deferring to the local elected officials therein. Perfect. Thanks, Cam. Does anybody want to? take a, a, a stab at that motion. I'll make the motion. I just didn't get it all. So what Mike said and then what Cameron said combined. <laughs> and I'll second that even though it's, it, it's um, obscure. I, I agree. I understand the concept and what it is, and I don't have the exact wording, but I'll second that. Thank you. Mayor Kafusi and Mayor Ramsey, a motion and a second uh, on that front. Uh, any discussion on this motion? Okay, let's take a vote. All in favor of that, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Perfect. That gives us direction on the CARES Act. Okay, thank you. Uh, that'll move us on to our next uh, uh, item of the agenda that we are, let's see, where are we at? We got 15 minutes about, Cam, to. Yep, and we should through, be able to uh, do it all. So here, perfect. Mr. President, here's where we have left. My clock says 143 uh, for the last 17 minutes. There are a couple other uh, legislative things that Victoria will brief you on, and then uh, important decision for the board to make around the inland port litigation uh, that uh, we'll get to in about seven minutes. So uh, hang in there. Victoria, let's take, let's wrap up the legislative stuff. Okay. 
So this slide that you're seeing now are some of the lingering issues from the April special session and then issues we have heard about. Um, and then we sent out a survey to a small core group of city attorneys and managers that we work with frequently um, about where they were at on some of these issues. So I'm going to go through these quickly. This is a combination of that HB 3009 that failed during April and then some other issues that have kind of been, um, come to the surface. So this first one, um, we've heard um, rumors about requiring a city to pay a fee or some sort of lost revenue if the city issues an emergency order. They would have to somehow repay that business for the loss of time that they were shut down during the time. And so um, we see this as if it does come up as uh, something that we would work um, to oppose and then the board would want us to vigorously oppose this. The second issue we've already talked about, which is the transportation, um, state transportation uh, stimulus. So I'll go past that. Three, four, five, and seven were some of the other top issues that this small group ranked in our survey. They all come from HB 3009. They were all issues that we asked for in the early stages of COVID. Um, and so we'll just keep an eye. I, I text Representative Hawks this morning if he was planning on resurrecting that bill. He said there weren't plans now but he wanted to hear from us if there were any emerging needs that we would need in a special session. So with all of these out there, what the board needs to think about is what is the most urgent at this point? Um, is it really flexibility from grandma or is it these transportation asks? Um, that's what we're asking today. Number six on here is um, something we raised at the last board meeting, which is the Property Rights Coalition, which is combination home builders, um, the, I'm, I'm blanking, the Renters Association and others, um, they had requested that the board engage in discussions about PIDs. And you will see in your packets the letter from the Property Rights Coalition to the board about this. Um, you will also see in the packet what they're proposing as their legislative change. And I don't think it highlighted very well in the PDF, but on page 33 in your packet, it's subsection seven, which would basically say that a PID is created, so the local entity could not refuse the PID if um, the mill levy was for four mills or less. So what we need to know is what you want us to respond to in the Property Rights Coalition. They, at one point, mentioned trying to do this in special session. We're not sure if they're still trying to do that or if this is something that you do want to engage in. Um, it could also be more likely done during um, the land use task force. So those are kind of the remaining issues that are on there. Um, and then the final one is, if you want to go to the next slide, Nick, is um, we, the board had committed to legislative leadership to work on water conservation and we've had a relationship with PREP 60 um, and there's, we've talked about um, working with them to, to meet this, um, make this commitment to legislative leadership to work on conservation. And Cam, I don't know if you have anything else you want to say about that, but those are the remaining issues that are out there. We're hearing that there might be a special session in June. Um, I've heard middle of June, but I've also heard that the speaker will be in like pal out week. So it could be the second week of June or the fourth week of June. Um, I've heard that it's just going to be a budget session, but I've also heard policy. And then we have you know, an offer rep from Representative Hawks to tackle anything that um, needs to be urgently addressed, whether those are lingering issues from HB 3009 or something like transportation or other budgetary concerns. So President, the, the guidance we're looking from the board here is the PRC did send a letter to the board around PIDs. Our recommendation would be to tell, to respond that for special session purposes, uh, we should only focus on um, issues directly related to COVID. That if they want to bring PIDs up into the land use task force, we're willing to 
discuss it, but no commitments about any outcome um, at this point. And then you'll see item three here. We're already on record on those different issues on 3009. We're just waiting to see on the timing and the special session. And then the number four is that the officers, the officers met with the Senate president and with PrEP 60, the water districts, about trying to get in front of all of the different water conservation related bills that the legislature keeps running that, that would undermine local government and to try to get in front of those and come up with our own recommendations. Um, so we just need, need on the pits piece, we would we'd like a motion for how to respond to their letter to you. And on the water piece, uh, we'd like ratification to start proceeding with putting together this task force uh, recognizing there are going to be other groups that are going to be looking for task force help, but we'll talk about those in June. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Thanks again, Victoria, for all your good work on this. Is there anybody that would uh, like to take a stab at, the, at a motion uh, to uh, support that the, the, the PIDS uh, is not discussed uh, in the uh, in the special session, but uh, but direct them to the land use task force, and then we'll go to the to the prep sixty one. I'll I'll take a stab at a motion um, on the PIDs. I would move that uh, we direct staff to um, tell the PRC that um, that issue is is better discussed outside of a special session when there's more time to consider the policy ramifications and that um, the and that PIDs will be considered by the board provided we maintain the local ability to um, to their the, the, the local control to create them Motion by Manager Hill. Does anybody want to second that? I'll second that. I'll second. Or go to Tasha. All right. Get her name. Seconded on the by minute. Tasha. <laughs> she's in. The, she's on the minutes. Yep. Motion made and a second. Any discussion on the motion? Okay. Let's take a vote. All in favor of that motion, say aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. aye. Anybody opposed? Perfect. Thank you. Uh, now let's go to uh, ratification of the PREP 60 uh, water uh, language. Um, anybody, uh, anybody brave enough to make that motion? I guess I'll make the motion, John Pike, that we support it as presented. Gary Hill, second. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Manager Hill. Motion and second. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Perfect. Ratification of that language is approved. Thanks again, Victoria, for your good work and uh, wish you had a, a uh, vacation plan to Lake Powell that we could work around, but uh, we'll work around whatever that is and go from there. Um, okay, number nine, Port. Director Dill. Yep. Perfect, well, you mentioned working around family things. I mentioned this at the top of the call, but with my wife being due in two weeks, I will be using family leave. And so I'll be building my work schedule around family leave as we get into the summer. So thank you again for passing the family leave policy last year as that'll come in handy. So it's fitting that the last board meeting before the birth of our second child is about the inland port, seeing that uh, the week that my daughter was born, she was born on a Tuesday and that Thursday I was at the Capitol for a meeting on the inland port. Uh, the inland port just follows my family around and, and Mayor Mendenhall knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, we can use a vacation to Lake Powell too. <laughs> yep. So the, here's where we're at. Uh, the Salt Lake City is, and Mayor of Mendenhall, by all means, jump in at any time. I chatted with your legal team on Friday. Uh, the, the city will be officially applying for an amicus brief from the league this week. 
uh, they would need the amicus brief, or they would need the motion by June 24th, and the amicus itself would be due July 22nd. Um, we put in the in the materials the presentation from January, uh, so you can see the major issues that that we discussed in that January board meeting around the Ripper Clause, municipal money, cities by special law, uniform operation of laws. My purpose today is not to talk about the legal aspects. Uh, my purpose is to remind you of the process and get your preliminary direction to the subcommittee about participating in this amicus brief, because this is not just an amicus brief around technical issues, it's rife with politics, and wanna make sure we're all on the same page when we proceed. Uh, one thing I'm very excited about, um, the, the ripper clause that Nick has pulled up here in front of you, is that uh, the city is collaborating with the Local Solutions Support Center. Uh, Mike, or excuse me, President, you'll remember at the NLC conference that I was on a panel, and I was on a panel with the Local Solutions Support Center talking about uh, the attacks of state governments against local authority, and I referenced the Inland Port as an example. Well, the city is going to work with this, with this center that includes my former law professor. And they're actually going to take a stab at drafting the Ripper Clause portion of the brief. And they have a national expert who has looked at these Ripper Clauses in state constitutions all over the country who's willing to participate in, in our effort and willing to participate in the amicus brief. They would need a local attorney, so whether that's a city attorney or Dave Church, uh, we would need to work through that. Um, and then these slides reflect what the law was prior to the session. The legislature did make some tweaks that we would need to go through as well. Uh, Mayor Mendenhall, is there anything that you wanna bring up uh, before I remind people what the process is for the amicus? Uh, no, we appreciate this and the opportunity for cities to access the resources through that uh, third party entity uh, and always happy to set up a phone call or, or you know talk to cities one-on-one -on -one if you have any questions you want to talk through any piece of the potential support we appreciate it president here's a reminder about how the process works we have a subcommittee that includes league staff includes representatives from the utah municipal attorneys association which currently would be uh, Mara Brown, who's the assistant city attorney in Ogden, and Sean Guzman, who's the city attorney of St. George. And then the subcommittee of the board includes Mid uh, Mill Creek Mayor Jeff Silvestrini, Cedar City Mayor uh, Miley Wilson Edwards, and Mayfield Mayor John Christensen. Uh, one thing that Dave Church and I realized on Friday is that uh, when the new board took over in September, we did not give an opportunity to new board members to join this subcommittee. So that's one thing, President. Uh, we welcome any other board members who want to participate in the subcommittee uh, to make that known during this meeting so we can, we can have them join that subcommittee. Once Salt Lake City submits their request based on the criteria, criteria that the league board adopted last year, then the subcommittee will meet and will deliberate over whether or not to uh, participate in the amicus. Uh, so what would be helpful for the subcommittee is to know if the board is comfortable um, participating, if the subcommittee believes that the legal ramifications are worthwhile, that the board is, gives their preliminary um, uh, direction that you're comfortable with participating because of the politics. Uh, that way, if you're comfortable with the politics, we work through it with the subcommittee, and then we would bring it back to the officers for ratification. Uh, then if the subcommittee approves, we can get working on that amicus brief in the next couple of weeks, uh, because again, the, the deadline is this summer, but I'll be taking some family leave during the summer, so I wanna get it started as soon as possible if that's your, if that's your desire. So President, I'll turn it to you to see if there are other volunteers for the subcommittee, and if there's any feedback around the politics of getting involved on the amicus. Perfect. Mayor Mendenhall, do you want to lobby for uh, anybody with the kind of snacks that are at this uh, subcommittee <laughs> meeting or what, whatever I, kind of fun meeting goes on? If, you know what? I'll have snacks delivered. No, it'll, be a, it'll be a phone call. Yeah, it'll be a phone call, but <laughs> snacks would be welcomed. And, and I'll just add the, the detail that our 
our staff right now is uh, they're working on um, the briefing. Am I getting the legal terms correct, Cameron? Um, that we we will need to be filing in the next uh, about 60 days. Um, and so the details of that will be available shortly. Um, and we'll, I'd be happy to, uh, I'd love to have a spot on an upcoming board agenda to talk through what we ultimately submit. And um, of course that would be the, the content of review for the subcommittee. Great, thanks for, thanks for the good work uh, of that subcommittee and uh, anybody that, uh, that, that would like to, to uh, be on that committee, uh, let us know. You can let us know now. You could reach out to Cameron. Um, no, I do need to know now so we can make the motion to include them in the subcommittee. Okay, okay. And if not, then right. we'll we proceed with the three of... board members we have. Okay. Is Mayor Silvestrini, are you on that one? I am on that one. Great. I appreciate that. Sure. I'm interested. This is Jewel Allen. Thanks, Jewel. Okay, anybody else? How many do you have on the committee now, Cameron? Did you say that? Yep, we have, uh, if you if we approve Jewel, she would be number four in, a, in addition to Mayor Silvestrini, Mayor Wilson Edwards, and Mayor Christensen. And then we'll have league staff, including Dave Church, general counsel, and the UMAA attorneys. And we'll set up a call once we get the Salt Lake request. Cameron, you yep, may you mentioned Sean Guzman's participating, is that right? Correct. So you probably don't need me. I'd be willing, but if you don't need me, I'll I'll let Sean represent us. Yep, that's fine. Sean's there in his capacity as an officer of UMAA. Okay. Okay. Perfect. If there's uh, if there's no one else. Thank you, Mayor Mendenhall, uh, again, for your good work, uh, your good hard work on that issue. Um, and uh, yeah, we're confident you, you, that subcommittee can get us to a good place to bring back something to the board. So, um, President, we need, we need a, a motion for Jewel, and then we would need um, a motion that I think would help the subcommittee to have a motion from the board saying we're, you know, we're comfortable. We realize this is a tough political issue, but you know, we will. We are comfortable with you proceeding despite the politics, as you accept the application from Salt Lake. The subcommittee will still make the recommendation based on the, the legal and policy issues. But I think it would help them to have that statement from the board on the politics. Great, great. So I'll Andy entertain Behrman a motion here to put Jewel on that. I was going to make ahead, the motion as stated by Cameron. This is Andy Beerman from Park City. Perfect. Thank you, Mayor Beerman. Is there a second? Jeff Silverstrini, I'll second the motion. Seconded by Mayor Silverstrini. Any discussion on this motion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And Jewel, you can't oppose yourself. You just already put yourself out there. So. Okay. All right. No one's opposed. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. That that's, all, that's, that's, all, that's all we had. Any other business that, uh, that anyone feels needs to come to, in front of the board? If, if not, I would entertain a, oh, go ahead. I'd move that we adjourn. Second, sucker. Gotcha, <laughs> <laughs> Mayor. <laughs> you beat mail call, call to us, that's great. All right, motion to adjourn. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Bye. Thanks, you guys. See ya. See ya.